All right, now we uh here for the reading of uh, Dennis Banks' autobiography. Uh, pleasure to have uh, all the comrades on here. Uh, we're gonna this is gonna be a short read. Uh, it's only probably about seven uh, pages long, but uh, I I think this is gonna be one of the uh, uh interesting read because I kind of a little cheated just a little bit. I don't, I read a little bit of the first part. But I think this is going to be a good discussion that can come out of here. So uh, as we always do, we're going to start with the statement of unity. So I'm going to go ahead and proceed and read that real quick. Yeah. It says the U.S. was founded as a colonial settler state based upon white supremacy and slavery, still in the lands of the indigenous nations, breaking every treaty made with them and confining them to reservations, quote unquote, concentration camps. As the country became more powerful, the Eagles suck its claws into other nations, making war on Mexico and grabbing its northern territory, including Cuba, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, and the Philippines, and either annexing them outright or making them colonies or neo-colonies. And in the 20th century, it became the major imperialist power in the world, exploiting both the people within its boundaries and those in every other country bullying them with military interventions and robbing them for their right to self-determination. As Huey P. News stated, we have two enemies to fight, racism and capitalism, unquote. Between the two, capitalism is primary, racism is a byproduct of capitalism. The working people of the world of every ethnicity or nationality face a common enemy that is destroying life on earth. Our enemy is a small ruling class of property owners controlling most of the world's wealth and resources. We have our basic needs met. Uh, we we must have our basic needs met to live a good and meaningful life: food, shelter, health care, education, freedom from oppression by the state, and peace with other nations. To obtain these essential things for life, we must have the power to see to it that the abundance that is available is shared equitably. That was a preface. Uh, so now I'm about to start on the actual statement of unity for the Second Rainbow Coalition. The legacy of the First Rainbow Coalition dates back to its founding on April 4th, 1969 by the original Black Panther Party, original Young Lords and Young Patriots organization. A number of other organizations joined this coalition not too long afterwards, such as the American Indian Movement, Brown Berets, Rising Up Angry, the Red Guards, and others. Since the founding of the United States, the masses had developed a number of popular movements that came together to, to fight back against this capitalist imperialist system in various ways around particular demands. Nevertheless, none had established a movement quite like the first Rainbow Coalition. This historic uh, movement was the first of its kind that established a model of class struggle like no other. Its charismatic leader, Chairman Fred Hampton of the Illinois chapter of the original Black Panther Party stated that at the end of the day, we weren't engaged in a race struggle. He said that it's a class struggle, goddammit. By uniting with the various oppressed ethnicities and masses, they were able to bridge the gap between the various ethnic communities that white supremacy had long sought to keep divided. This class solidarity equipped them with the material basis and class consciousness to see their common class condition, therefore the necessity of the to form a united front against their common class oppressor, the capitalist and privileged ruling class. The ruling class viewed this as the greatest threat to their class rule and subsequently used the entire repressive forces of the state, that is, the police, courts, jails, prisons, and intelligence agencies, etc., in order to crush this emerging revolutionary socialist movement. We refounded this Rainbow Coalition on May 14th. 2021 with the intent of upholding the legacy of the original Rainbow Coalition. We believe that this historic example is the model for the United Front that will best serve our class liberation by upholding the 10-point program of the original Black Panther Party, which was subsequently adopted and later expanded by the original Young Lords, Young Patriots Organization, and all other original Rainbow Coalition members. We established our programmatic unity. The six disciplinary rules that we uphold ties all organizations in our coalition to a common professional discipline. History has bestowed upon our generation a common class mission to fulfill. The representatives of the capitalist ruling class, uh, capitalist and privileged ruling class, represented by the Democratic Party, 
and the Republican Party cannot liberate us. It is their class in intention and interest to uphold our common class oppression. Therefore, it is only we, the oppressed masses of all ethnicities and, and nationalities, who must build the necessary class solidarity, class consciousness, organizational structures, and a united front that will ultimately liberate ourselves. This is what the Second Rainbow Coalition is committed to. This is the historic mission we intend to fulfill. Dare to struggle, dare to win, all power to the people, boots on the ground. All the members of the coalition is New African Black Panther Party, White Panther Party, Green Party of New Jersey, Poor People's Army, La Mesa Nacional de Brown Berets, Fury, which stands for Feminist Uprising to Resist Inequality and Exploitation, NASO, which stands for uh, North Alabama School for Organizers, New, New Era Young Lords, Guardian Rebellion, and American Indian Movement, Northeast Woodland Chapter. So with that said, uh, we're going to start on the, uh, I want to say this chapter three, chapter three of uh, Dennis Banks' autobiography. I want to ask uh, what Sally would like to read. Uh, kick us off when we uh, screen share this to the screen if she's interested too. I can read, comrade. All right. I would love to. Thank you. You're welcome. Can y'all see that screen share okay? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Y'all can uh, pinch it with your hand to make it bigger and turn it to the side if that makes it easier for y'all to read as well. Okay, chapter three, the yellow bus. The old boarding schools that Indian kids were forcibly taken to were concentration camps for children where we were forbidden to speak out, speak our language and were beaten if we prayed to our native creator. Dennis Banks, Ojibwe. Sorry, guys. My phone is frozen. Sorry, comrades. Hold on one second. There is one dark day in the lives of all Indian children, the day when they are forcibly taken away from those who choose who love. From those taken away from choose... You guys, my phone keeps freezing. I don't think I can do it. Okay. All right. I agree. Uh, there's one dark day in the lives of all Indian children. The day when they are forcibly taken away from those who love and care for them, from those who speak their language. They are dragged, some screaming and weeping, others in silent terror, to a boarding school where they are to be remade into white kids. Wow. That's big. Wow. That's big. It happened to me in 1942. I was young and did not know what was in store for me. An agent from the Bureau of Indian Affairs, a large belly man smelling of cheap cigar and beer, came into our home waving a bunch of papers, yelling, where are the kids who will be going? Everybody was crying. I was too small to understand, but I sensed that something bad was going to happen. My older brother, Mark, and my sister, Audrey, also had to go. Aunt Sarah picked some boxes of food for us to take along. The BIA man stood, um, uh, shoved us out of our house ahead of him. What was happening to us was uh, also happening in most of the other homes nearby. White men were hurting kids and parents toward the agency building. In front of it, a yellow, big yellow bus waited to carry us away. They took Mark and Audrey into the uh, bus first. I was clinging to grandma who was crying. I didn't want to go. Grandma gave me a little bit, a uh, little bag of snacks. Then somebody pulled me into the bus. A large group of parents and relatives watched us go. They were all weeping. I was crying too, but was slightly reassured because my brother and sister were with me and I knew most of the other kids. Audrey comforted me saying, we're going away to school, but we'll be back. Grandma will come and visit us. Then I really was frightened because I 
I began to understand that we were going away for a long time, not just a few hours. The bus had a radio that was squawking with all their all the war news. My sister fixed me a sandwich. I thought we was going to Walker, the only real town I knew, but they were taking us to Pine Stove, Mississippi. I mean, uh, Minnesota, a full 250 miles away. More than 11 years would pass before I would see my relatives again. Wow. I'm going to read that part again. More than, okay. Sorry, I was scrolling before. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, I know. Again. <laughs> More than 11 years ha uh, would pass before I would see my relatives again. It was getting dark when we finally arrived at Pipestone. My first sight was of a big gray stone building, grim and forbidding. Then I saw the school children who were already there. They were all dressed the same, the little soldiers in khaki uniforms. All the girls from the bus were taken into one building and all the bo boys into another. I cried out to my sister, Audrey, don't go, come back. But there was so much noise that she did not hear me. They fed us something and lined us up. Some of the teachers who were called boys advisors put us into a barber chairs and dusted us over with some awful smelling white stuff. It was DDT. They rubbed lots of it in our hair. I suppose it was to kill lice. We didn't have any lice, but they assumed we did. Then they sh shaved our heads down to the skin. I had worn long hair down to my shoulders. I felt uncomfortably naked without it. We continued through the line where all our clothes were taken from us. They issued each of us a government khaki uniform and stiff black shoes which immediately started to shaft above my ankles and soon rubbed me raw. I remember the years of pine stone as the years of bitter, uh, blistered feet. After, after that, we lined up to receive bedding and then took us to the dorms, which meant still further separation. Mark was put with some older boys, and I found myself among, some, uh, among strength kids in a large stone-cold hall. I quietly cried myself to sleep. When I woke up in the morning, I could not remember where I was. We lined up in the in three rows, the biggest boys in the back and the smallest in the front. I saw Mark standing in the back row, but could not find Audrey. I finally saw her standing near the kitchen. I broke the line and started running to her, but was stopped by the boys' advisor and pulled back. They told me I had to stay on the boys' side. Audrey had seen me, however, and waved to me. I waved back. We were marched two by two into the dining hall where I had my first breakfast at Pine Stone. We got our plates and found a table, but had to stand behind our chairs until the table was filled up. Only then were we allowed to sit down and eat. I was really hungry and got up for more food, but the visor chased me back to the table. I was taught to raise my hand and ask politely for seconds. That was the beginning of a life of innumerable rules. Only saw Audrey from afar standing with the girls. I wished so hard that I could be with her. They were marching us back from the dining hall to the main building when I broke away, trying to reach my sister. But the visors had sticks and used them to drive me and some of the other boys back into line. One of the advisors thrashed me with his stick. One of our advisors was Mr. Smith. He had been a drill sergeant in the army. He had a harsh, grady voice and had never talked. He barked. He was always talking about the army, which made men out of dumb boys. He lectured about, he lectured us on how the army built character and how a soldier stood as high above a civilian as a human being stood above a chimp. There was also Miss Smith, uh, Miss Smith. In contrast to her, uh, husband, she she was a nice, kindly lady. We boys were divided into groups of 10 with her in charge of my group. She always came over to talk to us and give us a little comfort. She tried hard, but we were kids. Well, but we kids came from such a different world that she could not really communicate with us. Our schedule was always the same. We woke up at six in the morning, went down to the mess hall, then to school, and finally to dinner. 
and then to the dorm again, over and over. In between activities, we were given dust mops and told to clean the whole place, where, wherever we happened to be. I was with 30 to 40 for, uh, first graders, although there were about 500 Indian kids in the school. Every time I had a chance to see Audrey, I would ask her, where's mom? When is she coming? When can we go home? Then I would start to cry because Audrey was a substitute parent for me and comfort, but the time I could, but the time I could spend with her was limited. From time to time, my mother would send letters to Audrey and Mark, and they would read them to me. Always, the letters would say, tell Dennis that mom loves him. But not once in the nine years I was at Pine Stone did my mother visit. Though most kids went home once a year for summer vacation, nobody ever came for us. I was lonesome. Not so much for my mother after a while, but I miss the woods and lakes, which remind, uh, remain vivid in my mind. <laughs> I yearn for Grandpa Josh and Grandma Jenny, drum beater, and always wonder how they were. Sometimes as if in a dream, I thought I could smell their sacred tobacco. It took six months before I could begin to adjust to my new surroundings. I could never really accept them. I didn't understand why I had to be there. During my first year in school, sleep was my only escape. I could not wait to go to bed. I pretended in my daydreams that I could fly, fly through the air to my old Indian home. I made some friends. There was Fred Long, whose nickname was Bo Jack, Fred Morgan, George Mitchell, Spoon Willis, and Pee Wee Brown. They were all Indian kids my own age. And they were especially close to me because they, too, never had a, any visitors and could never go home for the summer. For nine years, we were always together. I felt happy with them. The bond between us was so strong that we are still close friends, even now, 53 years later. But even with their friendship, sometimes the yearning to be away from the stone and brick keep and the longing for home was so strong that I could not stand, uh, couldn't stand it. Four times I ran away and four times I was brought back. The school's punishment for running away was the hotline. I had to run between two rows of other kids who held sticks and switches. As I passed through the line, they lashed out at me. It was like cold red in the military when you were disciplined by your fellow students. But that wasn't the only thing I felt. Later on, as an adult, I realized that any kids were sent to Pine Stone and similar institutions to separate us from our families as a matter of government policy, to separate us from our language and traditions in order to Christianize us or acculturate us, as they called it. We have daily indoctrination in the Catholic beliefs. In English class, the aim was to make us forget that we were in Indians. There were no pictures on the walls of Native Americans or Indian heroes such as Sitting Bull or Geronimo Instead, there were pictures and posters of white presidents and generals. <laughs> Sound familiar? Nothing could be seen that would indicate we were in a school for Indian children. I could speak some Chippewa when I lived at Pine Stowe, but after nine years in that place, I forgot it because we were forbidden to speak our native language languages. Our teachers only allowed us to speak English. Their effort their efforts to uh, acculturate us extended even as far as our history books, which depicted Native people as murderous, mindless savages. And one of these books was a picture of a gr uh, grinning Indian scalping a little wh blind white girl, one of those uh, cute Shirley Temple types. I began to hate myself for being Indian and made myself believe that I was really a white boy. I'm going to read that part again, because a lot of col col colonialized people, we, we, we go through this. I began to hate myself for being Indian and made myself believe that I was really a white boy. My white teachers and their books taught me to despise my own people. White history became my history because there was no other when they took us once a week to the movies, the 12 cent uh, matinee, I cheered for Davy Crockett. 
Daniel Boone and General Custer. I sided with the cavalry cutting down the Indians, cutting down Indians. In my fantasies, I was John Wayne rescuing the settlers from the Red Fiends. I dreamed of being a cowboy. My teachers had done a great job of brainwashing me. They had me, they they made me into an apple, red outside but white inside. <laughs> 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 a lot of us oh, got that about with that one, oh, especially God. coming up. There was a place called Stink Dorm. Any boy who wet his bed was put in there for a week. One summer day, we had iced tea. I drank so much of it that I peed in my bed that night. <laughs> I was embarrassed, but I told my friend about it, and they tried to help me hide my bed sheets. Somehow, the advisors found out about it and called, uh, called my name. Dennis Banks to the Stink Dorm. They shouted that at lunchtime so the whole school could hear me, hear hear them. Everybody knew what Stink Dorm meant, and they laughed at me. I had to stay in that place with some other bed wetters for seven long days. It was a humiliation I never forgot. After three or four years in this place, I gave up all hope of ever going home in the summer. Forty or fifty among us never did. We took care of the campus when the other kids were at the res with their family. We mowed the lines, painted the dorms, hallways. The school employees would, would also get us uh, get us to work for them doing their yard work. In the summer of my eighth uh, year, Grandpa and Grandma came with some other members of the drum beater clan. Their visit triggered a rush of memories and longing to get back to the Leech Lake where I had left my heart. After my grandparents went home, I tried to run away. The authorities caught me two days later and threw me in jail. Then I had to go through the beatings again. <laughs> in spite of the beatings and the futility, I was determined to try again. I was not alone and want, waiting to get uh, wanting to get as uh, far away from that place as I could. <clears throat> All my friends wanted to run away. There was eight of us, and we all had the itch to go. We decided to stage a great breakout. We knew that State Highway 75 ran north on a long, a long way into the unknown. But some of the older boys told us which towns we would have to go through. We planned our escape for the morning, and we went to breakfast and concealed as much food as we could, stuffing our pockets with it. Enough, we thought, to last a few days. We also uh, swiped some loaves of bread from the bakery. We also provided ourselves with civilian clothes. New boys arriving each year at Pine Stone had to give up their old duds in exchange for khaki uniforms. The stacks of confiscated clothes were kept in a special room. It was locked, but we managed to pry a window open and get in, grabbing whatever we could find. We then gather, uh, gathered out back, discarded our uniforms, and put on the street clothes, which, of course, didn't fit and probably made us look pretty odd. It didn't matter. We ran behind the main buildings to the corner of the campus, dodged through the nearby cattle farm from which our uh, school got milk, then disappeared into the cornfields. <laughs> the first day, we didn't dare stop but walked all night. It was freezing cold that year, uh, uh, that late in the year. We had forgotten blankets. We finally found a farmhouse crept into the barn and burrowed into the hay, close together to get ourselves warm. The next day, we took off again, walking down the road. Our food was already gone. We tried to hitch hikes, uh, hitch rides, but nobody seemed inclined to pick up eight bad, raggled Indian kids. The school sent two cars out after us. I was almost relieved to see them because whatever the punishment, they would at least feed us when we got back. And punished we were. They made us drop our pants. We were lashed with the uh, strap, 10 licks for each of us. Then we had to run through the hotline. I tried to dodge the blows, but every one of the boys in line managed to strike me at least once. When we made it to the end of the hotline, they shaved our heads and made us wear girls' dresses everywhere for three days. Despite such humiliations, I ran away nine times, always heading north. Always they caught me. 
when I was 11 years old, I was transformed to a uh, transferred to another boarding school at Wet Pitton, North Dakota. Hey, junior high school. I stayed there for three days. I was afraid to leave Pondstone, yeah. horrible as it was. It had become very familiar to me, and my friends were there. Besides, Wapetun might be worse, and it was. Wapetun is a Sioux word meaning those who dwell among the leaves. It is the name of one of the uh, Dakota Sioux tribes. Like Pondstone, Wapetun was a was run like a military institution. On Memorial Day, for instance, we marched stiffly in our uniforms and caps with our wooden play guns over our shoulders, marching to the sound of the band. Always before before us waved the stars and stripes, our conqueror's flag. I never had a chance to say or even think about what I wanted to be when I grew up. But I did know that I wanted to play basketball and soon made the C team. I loved the piling to the bus and travel with my teammates. I love yelling and screaming, the excitement of pulling off wins coming from behind, the thrill of us Indians beating a team of white boys. I liked that very much. <laughs> at that time, <laughs> at that time, I was still confused about who I really was. I envied the white kids for their money, for their feelings of superiority, and I longed for their whiteness. But I also knew that I was Indian. I enjoyed, I enjoyed my pals, enjoyed beating those teams of white boys and then feeling superior to them. It would take time to resolve this conflict within myself. I was at uh, Wapitan in the seventh and eighth grade grades. I was becoming a big boy, but not quite there yet. However, my emotions was there, and I wanted to be a, a, a be part of the game and did not want to be left behind. After the eighth grade, I was transferred again, this time to the big Indian boarding school at Flandreau, South Dakota, on the uh, Shanti Reservation, Shanti Shan Shan Reservation. Just as at Webberton, there was other kids from many uh, tribes, Ojibwa, Winnebago, uh, Pata, Patawatami. Potawatomi, Potawatomi, yeah. Yeah, good. can you Potawatomi. say those names? I know Lakota. <laughs> yeah, Potawatomi, everything else we're doing good. I mean, I, just, I didn't know if I should. Okay. Sac, everything is good. Uh, Sac, Fox, and Lakota. I only, well, well how do you say that other one, uh, the other name I was saying? Pata, uh, Wa, Wa, Pata. Is that how you say it? Hold on, which is W A H P E T O N. Wapatotomy? Yeah, you're seeing it right. Okay. I I was only there for about a year, but then I was 16 years old. In the ninth grade, I finally decided that enough was enough. I made my last escape. I ran away with Bojack. We are friends to this day. We walked from Flandreau, uh, 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 one night all the way to Pinestone, Minnesota, 18 miles along the railroad tracks. And then we caught a freight train. The freight car took us all the way from Pinestone to Wilmore, where we jumped out and hitchhiked to Bay Midget. I don't know how to say that one. Uh, Bay Midget. G. Let me, let me yeah. Yeah, so. From there, we finally made our way to Leech Lake Reservation area, and I looked for my mother. I found her near where I had been born. She was remarried and had other children with her new husband. <coughs> I needed to talk with my mother. I had felt so rejected by her. I thought by sending me away to boarding school, my mother had tried to get rid of me. I felt betrayed in those early years. I did not know then that it was government policy that forced Indian kids away from their families. It had never been explained to me, so I thought my mother somehow saw was somehow to blame for the years I was forced to live away from uh from home. When I came back nine years later, I never asked her why she didn't come and get me. She did ask me if I had received the letters, received the many letters she had sent, and of course I had 
I never asked the question, why didn't you come for me? I should have. I know now that I judged her too harshly. She was a victim of the system. Her life consisted of uh, consisted of unending hard work, and my father wasn't there to help her. She needed someone to love and look after her. She needed a husband. But in spite of everything, even before I, but before I understood, I loved her. At 16, I considered myself a, a man. The sense of a family to go home to was a thing of the past. I felt the strongest links of my family to grand Grandpa Josh, Grandma Jenny, and my mother's sister, Aunt Sarah. When I went into military a year and a half later, I listed my grandparents first as my nearest kin to notify in case of an in injury. Sorry, uh, the phone was going off. Then my aunt Sarah and my mother after that. At any rate, an important but painful part of my life was over. I was eager to discover what would come next. And that's the end of chapter three. Man, uh, I, 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 I want to say, first of all, reading that chapter, and I already knew. I already had a feeling like that's how it was going to go. I just, when I uh, started reading that first part, when he was uh, talking about going to boarding school, uh, I had imagined like it being like what it was like for me when I did uh, that year in boys' school. Uh, reading that, <laughs> to actually read it now, to read the whole chapter, uh, like it, it was like reading the time I did in a boys' school. And think about this. I did one year in boys' school, <laughs> and I was already – I was 17 turning 18. Like, I damn near could have been waved into adult court, but I was young. I was still 17, and I hadn't committed enough uh, juvenile crimes to get waved, so they just allowed me to go to boys' school. So I was 18 my whole time in boys' school, but I was 18. You know what I mean? And I was still stressed and – angry and bitter and but that's that's how uh, it was it was like for me in boys school it was like that but it was fenced in like a prison <laughs> so that's the only thing we couldn't escape or we would have did I would have did that a million times myself you know what I mean in that one year and that's all I did was a year so uh I, I, I would like to hear what uh I want to I want to hear what Sally uh you know you know being indigenous uh uh, Johnny Torres, Joe Gonzalez, you know, some of our indigenous comrades, Rafa, uh, Che. I want to hear what some of y'all have to say about this chapter. I want to start with Sally. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, so um, my dad was actually a uh, second, like him and his grandma, or him and my grandma were boarding school. Um, kids and uh, my grandma lost her language because of boarding school so um, like on my mom's side I know my language because uh, we had boarding schools but I don't know for some reason uh, the Navajo language survived the boarding school but there's a lot of languages that got lost and like to me that's the most super super important thing that we lost because like you can't get that that kind of stuff back and I mean my dad he doesn't speak Lakota but uh like we're still learning it now, but I asked him because he was boarding school kid and I asked him what was like the worst thing that could have happened to you or what's what do you think is the worst thing that and he he would say language like that yeah. we lost language because that's really important. It's like, uh, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, and that, how, how was like he uh, forced into boarding school? Was he like five or he was like seven, seven? Yeah. Wow. So yeah. he got to boarding school. And um, the boarding school that you're talking about here, Flanju boarding school, it's still here. So they, wow, they still do. And, uh, yeah, and then there's also another thing um, I want to bring up. <laughs> there's actually a movement uh, going around about um, all the dead bodies of children that they found yeah, in Catholic yeah. boarding schools and Catholic right. churches. And so that's a big, huge thing right now for us. Um, I know that they are doing like ground searches around certain boarding schools on the reservation. And um, the uh, Pine Ridge, or no, no, uh, I'm not sure which res in South Dakota, they actually kicked uh, churches off their reservation entirely. 
That's so they're not allowed to have churches on there, which is, I think that's pretty dope. And they're right. also going to all these boarding schools and they're doing all these like um, things in the ground and burying, finding all the buried bodies of all these children. <laughs> and they're taking back the bones back to their reservations. So, right. I mean, and you really don't hear, I mean, I heard a little bit about it, but like, it's really not, I don't, I'll ask my non-Indigenous comrades or anything about if they've ever heard about the boarding school victims. And a lot of them still don't know. Because right. I mean, it's it's like a horrible, horrible thing. The church to, right. you know, it just. But yeah, that um, I mean, my dad he he went through all like all the abuse, but he says most most definitely the worst thing was not being able to speak his language, right, because that's right. like how they could communicate, like with each other without. I mean, it, it's it's just it gets really really like like emotional to talk about it because it's yeah. I mean it's a sad story, but like. For him to tell right. me about it, it makes me so mad. Yeah, and like, yeah. Uh, I don't know. It's just yeah. the whole. Uh, I don't know. It's just hard to talk about. But yeah, not that's. Uh, I, I know uh, several of y'all probably saw that post I made a few days ago where I took that quote from Dennis Bank and made a meme out of it and put my own words in there. Like yeah. that right there is something. Like, even though that, and I, 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 this chapter is so important. Like, I think every person of color has to read that chapter. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because, like, when I think about even black uh, children, when we was going to these schools, like, they, we didn't even know that we were sending our kids away uh, to be indoctrinated, to hate themselves and stuff. Like when I'm reading this chapter from Dennis Banks, like I identify fully with that. I know a lot of y'all read my autobiography where I talk about that in there, that how I was, I started hating being black and stuff like that. I was trying, I was starting to, especially when we moved out to the suburbs and, and it was like a lot of uh, people with a little bit more money and it was a lot more white uh, kids out there and uh, I started identifying more with them or trying to because, like, everything in their history books, like, I was internalizing was making me, like, hate being myself. Like, and, and to me, that's just, like, our generation, I think what we have to accomplish in our generation to prepare the next generation to keep this revolutionary struggle going on, we have to have our own schools, man. Like, we cannot keep on going in the direction that we're going and think we're going to have, we're going to build a revolutionary movement because we're going to have kids that's going to grow up. And a lot of them is going to be lost to the system in some type of way. They're going to be in prison. They're going to be dead. Or if they're not that, they're going to be so co colonized that they have this selfish mentality of, of even the ones that make it out the neighborhood to the, middle class up uh, uh uh social mobility they're turning their back on us you know what i'm saying and they're they're seeing their way out of the struggles that some of us came from and they're not going to be contributing to developing our community building up our community <laughs> fighting for liberation fighting for self-determination like that's one of the biggest lessons uh well i say one of the biggest mistakes the black uh civil rights movement did to our generation, man, for real. Like I wake up every day. There's not one day now that I'm conscious that go by that I don't think about that. Somebody else. Let me uh, let me go. Uh, you know, listening to their story, you know, brought back memories of my life as a kid. You know, when I was six years old, my mother was about to have, uh, I think, one of her, she, uh, her breast, she had breast cancer, she had to go to the hospital, and but she couldn't leave him, she couldn't leave me with, with the man she was living with because he was an abusive man. He used to beat her, beat her up, and as a result, I used to run away from home. So I had a case in courts too at six years old. And so she decided to take me to court and the court decided to put me in St. Joseph Catholic home temporarily until my mother, you know, uh, goes through the procedures. 
I went to this home and it was Catholic. Not that it matters, but it was Catholic. And I think it does matter because they try to impose their beliefs on me. You know, every, I had a, I, every night I had to kneel down in front of my bed before I go to sleep and pray, which I didn't pray because I didn't, <laughs> I didn't make believe I was praying. <laughs> and and uh, then in the morning, at 4.30 in the morning, they'll wake us up and they will take us to church. Check that out, to church, Catholic church. They did. They just totally disregarded whether you was a Catholic or whether you was a Protestant or whether you was a Buddhist or whatever. They just, to them, you was a Christian. You was a Catholic, you know. And so I had to, I had to go to that subjective, you know. And I got caught up in a situation where one day I was fixing my bed and there's none because it, it, it was run by nuns. The name of the place was St. Joseph Catholic Home. It was run by nuns. And 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 uh, I got into it with this nun. You know, will you believe it? This nun took me and put me in a dark cell, in a dark cell, all the way down in the basement. You know, with no no door. The door, it, it was a door closed behind behind me. No windows, no nothing. It was dark. You know how long I sit there? Two days. Here I am, six years old. How can you treat, and you're supposed to be Catholic? Get the hell out of here with that bullshit. Excuse the language. But I get mad when I when I, when, I, when somebody claims to be something, and yet, man, they 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 they, they profess to be something else. You know, and, they, and so that's what happened. You know, and I was and, and I have to always, man, that you know, and another thing I got in I got into a, some scuffles with some nuns because I spoke Spanish. You know, with the kids that were there, some of the kids that were there, I used to speak with them, communicate with them in Spanish. And they say, no, you can't speak Spanish. You got to speak English. You know, it reminds me of a, it doesn't remind me of a time because I wasn't back then. But back in the 20, in the 20s, in Puerto Rico, you cannot speak Spanish. You cannot speak Spanish. If you spoke Spanish, the, 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 the U.S. government was, well, raid you and put you in jail. You know, if you had a Puerto Rican flag, they would put you in jail for five or 10 years just for having a Puerto Rican flag. So you imagine, ma'am, here I am in this Catholic home, you know, and I had to tolerate all the bullshit that they used to give me. You know, finally, uh, after a year, <laughs> I was so, I, was, I mean, I was so happy to get out of there. You know, so when I, when I listened to that, to that brother, man, the way his change, the changes that he went through, you know, reminds me of my time, man. You know, and not only my time, but a lot of other kids that are that get caught up in that situation as well. You know, they get caught up, they are forced to write to, to another language. It's like Native Americans. I'm pretty sure the Native the Native Americans that speak English today was forced upon them, you know, to speak it. Just like African Americans, it was forced upon them to speak English. And just like Puerto Ricans, it was forced upon us to speak Spanish, you know. And, and that's colonialism, man. That's man. that's colonialism. So I'm glad that 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 piece, man, that piece of information, you know, touched me, man. It almost made man. me cry. I, I hold back my tears. Man. Man. You know, man. I hold back Real. my tears. <laughs> man, anyway, I did. Man, I had to share a few tears because that chapter right there, man. I I I don't know what he's gonna talk about in the next book, uh, next chapters and stuff. But that chapter right there, like, touched me like no other, man. And uh, I, I really, really want our generation to understand, like, how damaged a lot of us are. <laughs> because huh. no matter if it was a boarding school, Catholic school, or in my case, public schools, these was dis just different form of colonialism. Colonial schools that really damaged us, like, I know I got post-traumatic stress to this day from all that bullshit they was teaching us. You know what I'm saying? Like, I really, I'm I, I'm so glad he really went in depth in some of those things. Because like I said, y'all read my autobiography. Y'all can see, like, how them schools, like, traumatized me. 
So by the time I finally woke up and started to see what was going on, it was like, oh, what? <laughs> what? This is why I'm angry? <laughs> this is why <laughs> I know some of that is the reason why I went to prison. I know some of that's the reason why some of that I turned to crime and robbery because I was angry at life, boy. Talking about Christianity and all that stuff, and that was indoctrinated in me. I know all that shit was post-colonial stress that I still deal with to this day. You know what I'm saying? Don't let one of them Bible thumpers come up to me and act like they gonna be pushing that shit around me in a way that's not even trying to help fight for liberation. You know what I mean? Just all save you. No, don't come at us with that stuff. If we can unite around the issues in our community, but don't be pushing that colonial stuff on us. You know what I'm saying? But uh, go ahead, Rafa. I know you got a lot to say. <laughs> no, I've been tuning in and listening and, and uh, caught my attention because I, too, was taken by that, that just the details of what went on when he describes his childhood. Uh, but, I, but speaking from the Chicano perspective, a, a Mexican perspective, especially because I was born in Mexico, my family crossed the border, came here to work. And uh, my dad was a bracero. They were exploiting people during that time. Uh, as workers, they, they sprayed them with DDT as well uh, and all these other things. And they treated them and left them to sleep next to the in the barns next to the animals. And this is supposedly during a, a humane kind of program that the U.S. had uh, to house farm workers. So when he brought us over, we we're undocumented. And the Chicano experience is a little bit different for a lot of us, but it's very distinct for the native brothers and sisters, the sister who just spoke, because the sister, she, she's right about a lot of things. And one of the things... Uh, is that they have been federalized with federal this, federal of that, and and they were going after the the, the tribes big time. Um, that were and those especially those who are standing up for us Mexican people living in Mexico and even people in South America, Central America, and even Puerto Rico, we were colonized with not just the the language of Spanish, but also the church, the Catholic Church, and I could say every Mexican grows up almost with that Jesus you know, that last dinner, supper, whatever it is, you know, of white Jesus and all these pictures of, of white Jesus and white uh, this and white that. And you go to Catholic, you go to catechism, which is basically a Sunday school where you get uh, uh, further brainwashed. So I grew up feeling the same way where you feel anger and you're wondering, um, you know, what's going on, especially when you're a little boy. The priest, I remember one time, a Catholic priest, who my ear, I never forgot that. And, uh, you know, I went, I told my mom and dad, they, they thought I must've did something wrong. And I'm like, nope, just pull my ear. And, and I was a little boy and that traumatized me just from, from being touched that way. Imagine uh, the, the stuff that others have gone through, but as a Chicano uh, coming up, didn't know my history, not knowing my history, I, I learned it. I learned it eventually when I went to college, I had to go to college to even learn any of that. And I too became angry, Kwame. I became so angry. I hated white people. I hated all white people. And I wanted to just lash out. Malcolm X was my hero, as a matter of fact. Crazy Horse was my hero. You know, these rebels that just lashed out. And um, what I realized later, because I gave, I left the church. I left the church early on in, in, in my teens because I knew that a lot of Mexicans, we, we have that as part of our culture. So it's endearing. But at the same time, that's, that's the danger because um, we're reinforcing that trauma. We're reinforcing those practices. <clears throat> but when I left the church, I I um, I joined. A, uh, I started an organization locally, but we joined a native uh, uh, a place where we would sweat, a location where we would go, and it was so um, awesome to be on the red road. And I was on the red road about twenty years with this organization or this group, and um, and it kept me straight, kept me focused. And but I also realized while they're with them, that we were revolutionaries. We weren't just Chicano. We weren't just Boricua and, and, and tribes and this and that. We we were revolutionary. Matter of fact, um, I met some revolutionaries in those gatherings, those native gatherings. And, uh, and it brought me back to focus about what we had to do. And I agree with you, Kwame, I think as and me as an educator, I've been teaching 23 years in public schools. I went to public schools myself. And yeah, even today, it's difficult to teach certain things here in liberal California, right? Even here, it's hard to bring up certain subjects, and and we and I agree that until we have some sort of freedom school, some sort of real uh, uh, school, uh, we're going to keep perpetuating the same stereotypes, the same feelings of self hate. Because I hate it growing up as a Mexican. A lot of people will tell you, though, your grandmother, for example, will look at a baby and say, and this is so common. Mira, look how look how beautiful this baby is. Uh, she it, it, she has beautiful skin. She's white. 
she like just like my uh, aunt or whoever, but then or 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 sister, and then she, but then they also say to a darker baby, oh, que triste, or too bad, how sad this child is dark, too bad, and and this still goes on even today. Though the use of these uh, or these practices, which are meant not meant to be harmful, but they are because uh, words are powerful, and we as Chicanos, we we were stripped of our indigenous languages. Many of us don't know it. So we know some of it, Nahuatl, Nahuatl, different uh, dialects and stuff like that, just like the Boricua and others. But we're, just, we're stripped of it, and Spanish became our language. And then when we try to speak Spanish here, we get in trouble for speaking a Spanish that was imposed on us, right? So, you know, as Brown Berets, I know that we uh, made a big change in the last couple of years uh, since I know, since I've been involved. And we said, nope, tear down the borders, tear down, tear down all these divisions. If you're indigenous, you, you can join Brown Berets. It, you, it's an experience, and, and we want to make sure that we know who we are as indigenous brothers and sisters, from Boricua to to Cuba to down Central South America to the Northern tribes. We need to we, we need to recognize that and reassert it, reaffirm that we are. Because some of us, you're right, we got that brown skin, and we're embarrassed to be, you know, who we are. We're trying to be something we're not. Um, but just you know, from my experience, uh, that childhood experience, going to the Catholic Church, and I left that a long time ago. Until we uh, wake up, that'll continue to perpetuate itself because it's such a strong uh, a thing ingrained, and not just mine, but in Chad, right, Chad, in, in your, your in hey. the or, or any right Spanish speaking community, That's it's right. ingrained in us to the point where we don't even question it. And here we are, you know, be living this this colonized life, not realizing it. I appreciate you, Chad, bringing that up because you reminded me of my my. Upbringing. You know, you know, the Catholic. Not to get into any church business. <laughs> and I'm not going to get into that, but the the institution of uh, of capitalism is the, is the institution that really began slavery. It was because of the dead they they they're the ones who first enslaved us. And I say us, meaning Africans, brown skinned people, you know, whatever, you know. And, and the church did that, you know. And I don't, I got away from the church. But the thing is, I just had a, I had an argument with, with an African brother the other day. Because he's he, he's a Muslim, you know, and and I respect that, you know. But he started saying, "Man, God's gonna do." I said, "Hold up, back up, man. God is gonna do for you, you know. But what God does for you, brother, I love it. But don't get me involved in that because God has nothing to do with me. I have nothing to do with God except that He said, well, 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 are you an atheist?" I said, "No, I'm not an atheist. I do believe, but not in your God." <laughs> you know, he said, "What God you believe in?" I call it nature. I said, "I believe in nature. That's my God." Mm -hmm. You know, he said, "Well, that's not God." I, I said, "Listen, bro, let's talk about that." <laughs> <laughs> we, we changed the subject because I hate for people man, to impose their shit on me, man. I hate that, man. You know, right. I really hate that. And, and, and the people I live here with here, they they Catholics also, so I, I'm surrounded by. Them. The enemy. <laughs> and, and you know, I, I know I mentioned how I was hating, I was hating all these people, hating white people, especially. And one of the things that I realized was there was some really strong allies out there who were atheists who rationalized with me about what was going on and and it really got to the root of what was going on. And 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 basically it comes down to capitalism. Money controls everything for the most part, right? Uh, but the church is one of those enforcers that that reinforces that. And uh, and at the end of the day, you start looking at uh, different people, um, and and yeah, regardless of their religion, I work with them just like you, Che. Uh, but yeah, as long as you know they got the right ideology and and uh, yeah. appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then you know the importance of this right here, man. It's a lot of black people that don't know how divided the brown community is. Like they'd be like, oh, see, we need to be more like the uh the brown. And you know, they use the colonial terms, uh Latin, Latino and stuff like that. And, you know, and I don't use those terms, Hispanic, I don't use none of that stuff. But I know uh their ways of thinking. And when when I come across them, I'll be like, man, well, you know, I'm a part of the second rank vote coalition. Like, <laughs> uh, we got indigenous, we got Chicanos, we got, you know what I mean? We got a wide range of uh different communities that relate to this movement right here. So we actually got a first hand account of what's really going on in the uh, Chicano community and in the indigenous communities uh, in the white community, you know what I mean? So 
this right here, these having these conversations where people are seeing that we actually a lot more alike <laughs> than mm -hmm. than different, like how people try to make it. Cause and plus one thing, and I think white supremacy has made black people feel this way. We feel like our culture, is, uh, our disunity is somehow more disunit disunited than everybody else. <laughs> We're like, oh, just well, black people, we just can't get our stuff together. We're the most divided people in the country. I'm like, ah, well, you probably should holler at some of my uh, Chicano comrades. Uh, they might uh, have some different, uh, differ with you on some of that because they talk about the differences in their community all the time and the divisions and the colonial thinking. That's one reason why, like, I have so much respect for this generation of Brown Berets. Like, y'all are heroes of this generation like seeing y'all even change our name and going back to indigenous culture using indigenous language you know what i mean like i i think you uh i know you saw me the other day taking up for y'all on instagram with one uh and she's a revolutionary like i follow her and she's like on point on 99.9 percent .9 of stuff but yeah. when she made that comment that post talking about our Chicano brothers is not indigenous. And I was like, what the, what the hell? I tagged Rafa in there. You know what I mean? I was like, man, you need to really educate yourself, uh, Conrad, because you, you, you sounded like a real uh, pushing settler type of narrative out here. You know what I mean? Like you don't recognize the Mexican American war. Do you not recognize even before that war, before the Spanish colonized them? that they was already here? Like, what are you talking about? You know what I'm saying? Like, I was angry for y'all. <laughs> you know what I mean? But uh, but that's why these type of conversations good because it keeps building that in, uh, that revolutionary intercommunalist solidarity where we always have our back. No matter if y'all present, just know I'm boots on the ground on all type of bullshit I hear in the black community. I'm pushing them to try to really wake up, wake up their consciousness. You know, and I know a lot of y'all doing the same thing. Uh, Joe uh, Gonzalez. I see your hands raised. Yeah. Hey, good evening, comrades. Excuse me, I was a little late this evening. I got I got in late from work, but um, in speaking, me and my, uh, my Ojibwe sister went over this chapter last night, and then uh, this is kind of what we came up with. So if I can have a few minutes, I'll, and I'll and I'll read it real fast. And just a summary of chapter three. So chapter three of the book about Dennis Banks, Ojibwe warrior, is pretty important. It's all about Banks' early life and the experience that shaped him as a person and an activist. The author, the author takes us through Banks' childhood on the Leech Lake Reservation in northern Minnesota, where he faced poverty, racism, and discrimination as an American Indian. The chapter also talks about how Banks attended a government-run boarding school where he was made to give up his Ashinabi Moan language and traditions. This experience had a huge impact on Banks and it fueled determination to fight for the American Indian rights and to preserve and promote American Indian culture. Chapter three sets the stage for the rest of the book by introducing some of the key themes and issues that the author explore, ex explores. These exclude the impact of colonialism and assimilation policies on American Indian communities, the struggle for American Indian sovereignty, and the important role that activism plays in bringing about a social and political change. Overall, chapter three is really important part of the book. It gives us a lot of background information on Dennis Banks and helps us understand the challenges and injustices that American Indians have faced over the years. It also shows us how banks and other activists work to address these issues and make a positive difference. The part that especially stood out to both the sister and I, and the and the effects are still seen today. It's been taking the language away. 
in the indigenous languages, include Ojibwe, are incredibly important for several reasons. Firstly, language is a key part of cultural identity. And the loss of a language can have a political impact on the cultural and social well-being of a community. That's right. For many indigenous communities, their language is an integral part of their history, traditions, and spiritual practices. Losing the language can mean losing a vital connection to their past and to their culture. Secondly, language is a powerful tool for communication and expression. Indigenous languages often convey knowledge and wisdom that is specific to their cultures, including knowledge about their natural world, medicine, and spirituality. These languages are off, also often better suited than English or other non-Indigenous languages for expressing Indigenous concepts and ideas. Finally, preserving and revitalizing Indigenous languages is important for promoting social justice and addressing the historical injustices that have been afflicted upon Indigenous communities. The forcible removal of Indigenous children from their families and communities and their forced assimilation into non-Indigenous cultures, including through the use of the boarding schools, has had a devastating impact of Indigenous languages. By promoting the use and preservation of Indigenous languages, we can help to right some of these historical wrongs and promote greater understanding and respect for Indigenous peoples and cultures. The only way to express certain things or encompass this in just one word things that can only be explained or expressed that way. So taking the languages takes everything. Mm. And that's what that's what we came up with. And I wanted to share that with you, comrades. And uh, uh, another great chapter. Looking Man. forward to chapter, looking forward to chapter four. We'll work on it. After and then I'll usually I'll just wait till after everyone speaks um because I take a little bit too long. But anyway, yeah, I'll you're good. Man, I'll that's what this is for. Comments. All prior to the people. Uh the point of language, uh, I think you hit on a very important point. Uh I got in a uh <laughs> kind of dialogue with a brother at, at the job, and uh he's he's a Hebrew Israelite, so like uh he believes. And then this one of the things, like I wrestle again within the black community, we have a lot of contradictions that like pits us against different groups that we have to wage against. And one of them is this uh this this belief that uh black people uh uh were were the real indigenous people uh uh of this land. Yeah, it was black people over here, but not not in the sense of how people be trying to make it out to be. <laughs> like my ancestors came from Africa. You know what I mean? My DNA is uh mostly West African, Nigerian. You know what I'm saying? So and I know this because my sister took the DNA stuff. <laughs> you know what I mean? But the point I'm trying to make is that he believes that he's from over here and nothing can make him believe that his ancestors didn't come from Africa and weren't slaves over here. You know what I mean? But because they took our language, <laughs> like he don't know he's African. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? He's Nigerian or Dahomey or Ashanti. He's one of those. You know what I'm saying? But he can't get it in his colonized mind that he's African because he's been indoctrinated with this Hebrew Israelite stuff that disconnects him and turns him into a settler thinking person. You know what I'm saying? And that, that right there, language, language was a critical lifeline to our cultures that was stripped from us where some of us have took on a settler mentality. You know what I'm saying? And, and and reinforce this assimilationist, or even in his case, he's more of a separatist, or, uh, no, I wouldn't even say a separatist. He's more so of like, let's get ahead in America, but we the original people. You know what I'm saying? I want to have both of, uh, best of both worlds, uh, and, uh, the worst of both worlds, I would say, not the best, the worst of both worlds. You want to push a settler uh, view 
in relation to indigenous people saying that we're the only indigenous people and they're not indigenous, we're the original, which is bullshit. You know what I'm saying? I feel like that's like some of this stuff. I be feeling like Cointel Pro inspired and stuff. You know what I'm saying? That like the government made sure certain groups in our community survived to divide us. You know what I'm saying? By taking out the ones like the Black Panthers that was educating us and bringing consciousness to our community, raising the consciousness of and, and the solidarity with our revolutionary intercommunal relationship with the other oppressed communities. But that right there is a good point right there is the language. Like those individuals over here in the United States that don't know where they're from is partly because they don't know their language. Like, I don't know what language uh, uh, that my people spoke. You know what I'm saying? I've, I've been getting to uh, learn a little bit of this uh, from talking to some of my West African uh, friends at jobs and stuff like that. But that's that took us away from a lot of our roots. You know what I mean? And when you take the people from their roots, you can easily assimilate them and manipulate them. You know what I'm saying? So I, that's a good point, uh, Conrad. I appreciate you speaking to that. I want to uh, get to one more. Uh, one of my okay, go ahead, uh, Joe. Did you have something else to yeah. say, Joe? Okay. Yeah, excuse me. I'll, I'll be real quick and brief. That was that whole uh, colonist way of thinking, uh, too. And they had a term: uh, "Kill the Indian, save the man." And and that's what they've done, not just to our indigenous brothers and sisters, but to the, to, to the, those from Africa and other parts of the regions. Um, so, and they did it by language, but one of the things that Dennis Banks did, what, what ended up making them what we would call a revolutionary soldier was the whole thinking of they're taking everything from us. We got to stand up. We got to fight. And this is, what we're like they said in the book, we're facing this today, and it keeps on going on and on. And let's stay strong, comrades. Absolutely, all, all power right. to the people. All power. We're gonna leave uh, the bet the last uh, the best for last, my comrade Johnny Torres. I want to hear your thoughts on this, comrade. Then I want to uh, bring my host in, uh, uh, Trisha uh, Z. So she can uh, speak to some of uh, uh, some of this. How she, uh, I always love hearing her thoughts about this. Like uh, this one, one of my lifelong comrades. I can tell you that already. <laughs> Go ahead, uh, Johnny Torres. Well, um, <clears throat> there were certain parts of the the chapter that uh, got to me, and I know uh, it got to everybody else. Where he was, he's saying that um, they were trying to make us white. You know, so because I think we all go to uh, that a chapter of our lives when we're, uh, I guess, in school or, you know, we're being taught something very young and, you know, our minds are fragile, you know, and we kind of like absorb whatever we're around in our surroundings. And that's kind of like what happened to a lot of us, you know, growing up and, you know, we believe this and that. But, you know, as we got older, we already noticed that we we're being lied to, you know, a, a lot of things. And, you know, especially of our race and where we come from, it was just, you know, we're being whitewashed like a lot. Like, you know, the whole thing about I, I, I became like a, a red apple, you know, when he was saying that, you know, that that kind of like happened to me, too, because uh, at a time it, it did get to us. But we broke out of that mentality where we realized this is all bullshit. You know, um, we figured that this whole this whole game of of education was all rigged just for them, you know, to trick us, you know, but it, it did take a while for us to break away from that mentality and to realize, you know, this is not what our, our, our ancestors foreshadowed for us. And uh, I'm glad that we were seeing the truth and we're all awake and we're seeing what was going on. It's, it's a better time than now, for sure. I, um, I want to read a, a part of my book uh, there's a poem that's called uh, Indigenous Blood that's exactly about what's going on and uh, especially the chapter we just read. Okay, and it's, it is from my new book, so I'm going to read, I'll read that, that poem. 
and it's called Indigenous Blood. I hope everyone can hear me really loud. Back in the day, because of religious beliefs, religion caused men to burn women at the stake at their leisure. Today, more desperate to take over her womb. Religion is annihilator. Make no mistake. The Catholic Church is strong because it's run by demons and pedophiles. All they worry over is their own blood money, not over the poor children who suffers at the hands of those who are supposed to protect them. We demand the release of all the records so our children can truly rest in peace. Whenever our indigenous blood is spilled, you will forever hear the wind cry of truth. And all committed these hateful crimes will be haunted by their trauma. I will speak the truth regardless if it kills me. Too many fables and lies have piled up. All there is left to do is burn that motherfucker down. I have no sympathy for torched churches, especially when they have something gruesome to hide or the tearing down of the statues of psychotic heroes, but the lives lost to these false prophets who wish to return all the considered privileged people sobbing over their supposed martyrs that are being demolished. If your children were kidnapped, being raped or murdered, would you then want the guilty person responsible to be glorified? The queen reign is over, so off with their head. Reality is the oppression to the oppressor. The churches themselves burn down their own churches to torch the lies to dust. The our children's bones, the churches fail to hide. Our ashes and bones remain. Why Jesus has much to explain. Let the churches burn and crumble for the guilty who murdered our babies, babies who cannot understand, babies of the oppressed. We deserve better. You burned our innocent children's bones. Their souls have spoken and revealed our direction. Fuck the murderous monarch for spilling our precious indigenous blood. Thank you. That's a good book, man. That's a good book. Hey, hey. His his man, if y'all haven't read, uh, which I know a lot of y'all haven't since it's just coming yeah, out. Came out. Yeah. Yeah. I'm plugging you right now, Conrad. <laughs> man, <laughs> his uh his his uh book of poetry is this man real quick. How you write back, cuz I'm in mean, the uh, uh book reading. All right, bye. Uh yeah, just to let y'all know I only took that call because my uh, my uncle, which is her dad, just called me. Uh, recently died and stuff. He had uh, uh, he was he was already went blind, and he died of cancer. But yesterday, so uh, I'm gonna have hit my cousin back on that. But I just want to say, man, like his book of poetry is very, man, deep. Uh, is it is poignant? It's so poignant, like. It's, to me, it's autobiographical, too. Like, you see why Johnny Torres is a revolutionary. You know what I'm saying? His his uncle uh, uh, was murdered by the police. That's, that's one of his uh, awakening when it came to revolutionary uh, consciousness and stuff. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, if y'all if y'all like poetry, uh, y'all want to read a good book of poetry, Johnny Torres' book uh, uh, is is one of the best books of poetry. I told him he's the Brown Langston Hughes of our generation. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about, bro. That's what it's about right there. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because, like, he speaks to the heart of this generation when it talks about our struggles, when it talks about decolonizing our minds and stuff like that. What was the history that we suffer from uh, in our struggles that we went through. So if y'all haven't uh, purchased a copy yet, man, uh, hit Johnny Torres up. He's one of the comrades of the Second Rainbow Coalition. Big uh, respect for this brother. He started off with us with this book reading. Glad he's still on with us. But uh, appreciate you reading that, man. That was that when I read that uh, that uh, that poem uh, that you wrote, uh, Indigenous Blood, like. I thought that was very, very on point, very powerful. It resonated with me. You know what I'm saying? So uh, I, I appreciate you. And throughout this, while we reading this book of Dennis Banks, when you on here, if you uh, find one of your poems you want to read, definitely share them with us. You know what I mean? So people get a little glimpse of what they're going to be purchasing when they get your book. So I appreciate cool, you. Brother. I don't mind. 
I appreciate you sharing that. I'm gonna get to you, Gabby. I'm gonna get to uh Zen first. Uh I, I wanted to go around to all my Disney's brothers and sisters and, and and let them speak first since we uh reading a book that's related to their uh their history and uh culture, some of their predicament. But I wanna hear uh Zen what what she what she thought about this chapter right here. And then I get to you, uh Gabby. Um, there's a couple things I want to touch on because there's a multifaceted issue there with the erasure of language. It's not just the language, it's um, the religious practices and dance, etc. All of these things were outlawed to completely like do a, a social form of ethnic cleansing where, you know, it's, it's erasing all ties to indigenous identity there. It wasn't even till the fucking 1970s that some of those laws started getting repealed that were banning religious practices and dance and whatnot amongst the various indigenous tribes. And so for to go for that long with not being allowed in, in a country that's supposedly, you know, supposed to have this separation of church and state and you know, have a foundation of religious freedom, which is hella getting, you know, air quotes here because it's all bullshit. All it was was them wanting to set up shit of being able to choose what flavor of Christianity you prefer. But it was fully intended to be a form of genocide. That is to completely erase any connection that you have with your history, with your roots. And it speaks volumes that that is one of the things that everybody is pointing out of like, yeah, removing my language, removed my tie to all of these other things. Um, the other thing that I wanted to touch on is uh, with the education, because right now, you know, we're dealing with a lot of shit with one group of people wanting to bring forth real history to be taught in schools so people actually have an understanding of where we come from and therefore what fuck ups to not repeat and how to do better. And then we've got dissidents calling it critical race theory because they feel like, oh my God, you're criticizing me for being white. No, we're criticizing white supremacy. We're criticizing this whitewashing of every fucking thing we're criticizing the fact that you want to sit here and be like, oh, but you might hurt my kids' fifis if you teach them about white supremacy and slavery and all of these things here. But they're not concerned at all about the way that makes black and brown and red kids feel when the only fucking things they're learning in school about any of their history is the negative shit. You know, like when they go into Black history, they touch on um, slavery and on the civil rights movement and nothing in between and expect you to, you know, be okay with this idea of like, oh, slavery ended, but they don't tell you, you know, like the 13th Amendment actually did not end it at all. It just allocated it to the prison system. And the same thing's happening with, you know, the things that they teach about indigenous history too of you know this bullshit that Dennis pointed out of Indians scalping little white girls no in actual reality in history it was white colonizers who were going around scalping people in blaming the indigenous for it and it's like what kind of mind fuck you playing at here but they want to get mad that people want to teach about the actual oppression being done by white people in history because their white kids might feel bad about it. To me, that's fucked. That's why we need real history being taught to everybody across the board, not just to indigenous children, not just to black children, but to white children as well so they can understand like, no, this is not somebody pointing the finger at you and blaming you for being white. Nobody controlled what flavor or what what uh, what color their their skin is, <laughs> what flavor of human they are. <laughs> 
nobody chooses that. We don't have a choice in that matter. We are born as we are, and we are all human beings. It's a matter of teaching them this is where people fucked up in the past where you can do better. This is something to learn from these mistakes so that you can do better and be better. And that doesn't just involve calling out the harms and the oppression. That involves also incorporating things like people of indigenous ancestry and black ancestry who contributed to innovation. These inventors who we would not have the technology we are talking over right fucking now if it was not for black and indigenous inventors actually creating the things that we are using in our cell phones and in our computers. There are things like that that if those were actually being taught, then Maybe kids wouldn't have this negative self view because the school is only fucking teaching them bad shit. We need to do better. We need to do better. And it involves teaching real fucking history and absolutely rejecting this shit when people try to call it critical race theory because they personally feel criticized for what level of fucking pigment they have instead of having some understanding and some empathy for what other people have experienced in life. Absolutely. And you you know, one thing too, uh, you hit on a good point. Like they, when they talk, and even though even this is superficial, when they bring up slavery or they bring up uh, uh, civil rights, like it's all like watered down. Like I, a lot of black people don't even know like who Martin Luther King was by the time he died. <laughs> like they have a very, very watered down, I have a dream speech type of view of Martin Luther King. Uh, this same brother I was talk, talking talking to the other day, uh, I was telling him, I was like, man, do you understand that Martin Luther King recognized that he was wrong and started going in a different direction? That's why they murdered him because he started going, uh, started recognizing it has to be a, a class struggle, a human rights struggle, not a civil rights struggle. He said, I, I feel like I integrated my people into a burning uh, building. You know what I'm saying? Like, he didn't know nothing about this. But he had the nerve to tell me, uh, Martin Luther King, he was a, he was working with the FBI and stuff. I was like, okay, well, show me your evidence. You know what I mean? Because, you know, it's a lot of Cointel Pro papers out now, so we know who's who. Now, show me your evidence. No, it was just his, his what he was pushing for. Well, just because a person pushes something in the beginning and made a mistake, when they acknowledge they make a mistake, you know what I'm saying? Martin Luther King didn't have a lot of people before him to uh uh to analyze, you know what I mean, off. to come up with a you know, for if for that time in history, that was radical. You know what I'm saying? People forget that that was mm -hmm. radical what he was pushing at that time, even though it might have been wrong headed. You know what I'm saying? Where our generation recognized that today, like that's why we push revolutionary and communalism. Like we build self determination in our own communities. You know what I'm saying? That's not pushing integration or separation. It's a very healthy approach of grassroots developing. You know what I mean? And and staying connected to the other oppressed communities that's doing the same thing. That's different from separation and integration. Dang. You know what I'm saying? But one other thing that uh because that's all they do teach with black history is slavery and civil rights. A lot of uh, people over here, including our brown comrades, our indigenous comrades, our white comrades, they don't know the history of what we were in Africa. You know what I'm saying? Like right. we came from, in, and then this is not the uphold of, of the class oppression that of uh, the civilizations that we came from, but we wasn't what they told us. They, they made us feel like we were savages and heathens and, you know, I mean, we we never developed no culture. Look, we had universities, and I'm pretty sure everybody over here heard of Tim Buck too. You know what I mean? Might not know the details of Tim Buck too, but this was a place where we had universities that people around the world was coming to, just like people come around the world to go to Harvard and Yale and and all these prestigious schools over here in the United States. We had those over there. There wouldn't be no Plato and Socrates today if it wasn't for our African uh, universities that was teaching the Europeans that destroyed their own their own history, 
and went through a yeah. period of barbarism and stuff, the Middle Ages, where a lot of that literature was lost. We taught them their own history again. We said, oh, you don't know about Plato and Socrates? These were great people of your culture. And we translated that into Arabic because a lot of the ones in Africa were Muslims at that time. You dig what I'm saying? And they spoke, a lot of them, because they was influenced by the Quran. And that's a whole nother discussion because we can talk about the colonialism of Islam as well. You know what I mean? But that's a whole nother subject. But the fact mm -hmm. of the matter, these were black and uh, uh, Arab people that was educating the Europeans about their own civilization. You know what I'm saying? But they don't talk about that. We was doing cataract surgery <laughs> over in those uh, 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 empires, the Songhai Empire and stuff. That was the last one. And that was only 500 years ago, people. 500 years ago. But they would never tell black people over here that 500 years ago, you was a part of a great empire that was recognized by people across the whole world. You know what I'm saying? Right. So this is another thing why history is so important because it connects us to the contributions that our people have made to human civilization that ones over here today take for granted. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? But uh, I got one more question before I get to you, Gabby. Uh, Cause uh, having our white comrades on here, this is an educational too. Uh, how was these? I know that you look at them now as colonial schools, but when you was coming up in grade school and uh, 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 going to high school, how did that education uh, come off to you? How did it make you feel? How did you see other cultures like? Uh, Cause like for us, we internalize it in a way where it denied us our sense of humanity where we wanted to, uh, some of like Dennis Banks was saying, and like some of the comrades on here saying, like I even said in my own book, like at one point in grade school, I was trying to identify with being white more, you know what I'm saying, than I did being mm -hmm. black, you know what I'm saying, because it made me feel ashamed of being black. Like how did that type of education uh, uh, make you feel as a person when you look at retrospect when it comes to the white population dealing with like those colonial schools? You asking me? Yeah. I'm going to ask uh, Rob Strong too when, uh, when he speak as well. Mm. Um, honestly, I'm really thankful that I had some very forward thinking teachers at the school system that I went to. Um, one of whom, Vicki Weiss, was a Jewish woman who was very much leftist. <laughs> like, mm. she, she was left of even the liberals that were in our area. And so she would actually teach us a little bit more than what was actually in the curriculum as decided by the school board and stuff. So thankfully, we got a little bit broader perspective than that. Um, also, when I was in high school, I was also dual enrolled in college and was taking classes on multicultural history and was able to get a broader perspective than what was just being taught in the history of classes at high school that were, of course, very Eurocentric. So I'm, I'm thankful to have had those influences there to actually dig deeper into real history and show me there was more to history than just this Eurocentric shit. Um, because at least I had that awareness of things like, okay, science and philosophy didn't just fucking start with the ancient Greeks. They learned that shit from the Moors, <laughs> you know? Like there's, there's so much more than what gets touched on in your basic school curriculum that's whitewashed as fuck. And it definitely needs a lot more improvement, but it, at least in my experience, I am glad that I had some teachers who went above and beyond that to make sure that we had some more cultural awareness. Than, that's what's up, you know? Absolutely. Gabby. I know you've been uh, waiting uh, uh, about you. I know you about to spit fire at us now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but what you think, though? What What you want to well, uh, say? Well, um, I, well, well. First, I just want to apologize for not being able to come um, for um, for um, for the reading of the of the chapter. The time slipped by, and I thought um, for some reason I thought I thought the book club was going to start at eight. <laughs> it was actually at seven. I'm like, oh shit. 
So um, so um, I'm gonna read chapter three on my own to catch up with with with, with y'all. But um, the first question I want to ask is, what's the book? Um, what's um, what's the book called that um, that um, um, that Johnny Torres wrote? Um, because um, because as y'all were talking about it, I want to know what's what's called so that way I can so that I can so that way I can bookmark and order it. It's uh called Resurrecting El Barrio. Resurrecting El Barrio. All right. Um, thank you, Johnny Torres. Um, and um, well, I mean, well, well, I mean, every single one of you guys brought up some great points, but um, yeah. When it comes to the education system in the U.S., right, people need to realize that the education system is a part of the state, you know, is a part of the state it is used to directly give us a whitewashed, distorted, bourgeois thought um, outlook up, up of of not just the U.S., but of the entire world that, you know, that things have just always been this way, that, you know, that that, that there is nothing before what is now and that, you know, and that and, and, that, and that there's no possible chance of causing it of causing any change because the education system is made to do two things a to make us more exploitable workers and b to make us um um to give us a whitewashed white supremacist outlook of of the world of other cultures of other nations and making um and either um and, and, and bolstering white supremacist groups and um and further um and further spreading um reactionary Sentiments because they, because um, because because as y'all were saying, there are so many innovations and so many um and so many accomplishments that um that non-white people have achieved that are just not talked about at all. The first traffic light was made by a black person. The first ever successful the first ever su successful heart surgery was done by by a black person. Potato chips were, were was made by by a black by a black person. Water guns was also made by a black person. There are so many things that are just not talked about that non-white people um that not that non-white people have accomplished and it's saddening and it's specifically used to um to um to further cause self-hatred to further cause um to fur um to further cause um non-white communities to feel like they haven't contributed at at, at all that things have just always been this way that the reason why they experience these things it's just because um um, it's just because they've always been this way when that's not true. That isn't true whatsoever. And the Black Panthers, as well as these other amazing revolutionary movements, used cultural revolution, including language and art and music, to actually um, empower, to actually empower their communities and show them that things have not always been this way, to show them how revolution should be, how it's going to be by using culture. And and the thing that y'all were saying about language is so true because language is one of the most pit of is one of the most um primary um pillars when it comes to language. I mean, look at I mean, most countries in the world um are named after after the language they speak. Uh, people from France speak French. People from people from Spain speak Spanish. People from Portuguese um um people from Portugal speak Portuguese. Language is one of the most primary aspects of one of one's culture. And when white supremacy and and settler colonialism and um and um and westward expansion was taking part in the US they actively they actively um they actively um um they actively engaged in cultural erasure and to, and uprooting non white people from their culture from their communities to actively oppress them subjugate them and exploit them for their own benefits and um and the thing that and the thing that comrade zen was saying was so true um, we're not criticizing. We're not criticizing white people for being white. We're criticizing white supremacy. We are criticizing the upholding of um, of the contradictions of capitalism and of white supremacy. And while um and while um and obvious and and while you cannot choose um what skin color you were born with, you can choose um if you uphold white supremacy or not. And that's why education is so important. You can choose. You, you can't choose who your ancestors were, but you can choose if you can, if you still uphold this type of system. You you can still choose if you if you're willing to participate in the exploitation oppression of all of mankind, all for the sake of, all all for the sake of, of a few people who don't give a fuck about you. We're just using you to to um to um to um to to, to, to maximize profit and get and get and get and get the, and get and get what they want. And um and um you know 
And um, and that's why it's so important to as as us white comrades to learn from our BIPOC comrades, to learn from them, to engage with them, to submit ourselves within their materialistic conditions and learn how revolution will happen through their lens. Because as I've said many times, non-white people are going to be the ones leading the revolution. <laughs> non-white people are going are going to be the ones leading the, the, the revolution. Not white people, non-white people. So uh, yeah. In, if I hey, uh... take a moment to add on to that. Um, let, let, another, me, let me say this real quick. Okay. Hey, how, how old are you, Gabby? I am 19. I'm about to turn 19, 20. <laughs> 19, y'all. Look, me me and uh, Zen, we had a conversation with someone today, and we talked about Gabby. And uh, <laughs> I was one of the points I made. I was like, yeah, Gabby uh, is young <laughs> and already very, very well educated. Uh, I I was talking I was talking to this comrade. I said, man, when I was uh, Gabby's age, like I didn't think like her. You know what I'm saying? Like I didn't have that way of analyzing stuff. I, when I was 19, I was robbing a bank. <laughs> I was out here on some, <laughs> you know, what I, mean? yeah. I was out here on some illegitimate capitalist bullshit. You know what I'm saying? Even though <laughs> at least it was a bank and not the people. You know what I'm yeah. saying? <laughs> it was on the bank. It was on but the bank. <laughs> at the end of the day, I was still on individualist way of thinking. Like I couldn't yep. couldn't even begin to articulate uh what Gabby can articulate at the age uh that she's in now. So I just wanted to point that out to y'all because I knew none of y'all knew this, but but probably me and Zen and maybe a few others on here. But this is the reason why I point that out is because I was telling this comrade that's older than Gabby, I was like, this is why we can learn from even our youth that is yep. already building class consciousness, already decolonizing their mind and stuff. You know what I'm exactly. saying? So when you heard Gabby speak, I know everybody was on here like shaking their head like, that's right, that's right. But you didn't know Gabby was 19 years old. Yep. But these are the type of revolutionaries we raising up in this generation because Gabby's exactly. generation, that generation is going to be the ones that lead this generation too. Mm -hmm. It's going to be the youth. It's going to be BIPOC, but it's yep. also going to be the youth. Exactly. Say, so I wanted to point that out. Um, um, as, go ahead, Zin. Well, um, uh, a short comment on that part of one of the things that I pointed out to the other comrade in that conversation was we have to realize as people in our 40s or in some of our cases even older that sometimes we need mentors who are 10, 15, 20 years younger than us. Not just mm -hmm. mentors who are older than us, but mentors who are younger than us to keep our minds sharp, to keep us paying attention to the changes that are happening in society that we need to actually bring to the table in order to actually fuel this revolution. Gen Z really gives me some fucking hope for actual oh, yeah. real change happening because you guys have zero fucks to give about yep, any kind of reformism, any delusions about that shit helping. You guys yep. are coming out swinging, ready for revolution, and I fucking love it. Um, oh, yeah. To circle back around to the other part I wanted to point out as far as the education going and it being so whitewashed and lacking, the other facet of that is that um, I don't know how many of you actually uh, like are, are up to date on what's been happening with these neo-Nazi groups recruiting young kids and shit. One yep. of the things that they are using to recruit these kids is these lies of Eurocentrism telling yep. these kids that every fucking good thing that's ever happened with you know, um, society is becoming, you know, first world and shit. They're like, oh yeah, we made everything happen. No. Nope. Like, First nope. of all, what's this we motherfucker? You weren't even born yet. Yeah. <laughs> Second of all, no, that is absolutely whitewashed bullshit. Yep. That is yep. absolutely false. You know, but that's part of that frame of mind where they get that false sense of superiority from is thinking yep. that every development, every fucking step forward as far as tech or anything else, medicine, etc., is attributed to Europeans. Yep. Excuse me? When it's, like like that no. like that makes like yeah, no, that makes no sense. If anything, um if um if anything, 
um, when um, when the Sarawak colonial colonists came over to the U.S., it was the indigenous people who taught who taught them their hygienic practices, and that's why there were so little diseases yep. in, in in America in the first place. It wasn't um because because I've heard this whitewash fucking bullshit about oh the reason why um the reason why um the reason why um the reason why there weren't that many diseases in America was because oh they just didn't get sick enough, and why didn't they get sick? Because they didn't have they had hygienic practices that prevented them for, from getting sick, that prevented from mutations f- f- from spreading, uh, unlike the shit that was happening in Europe when they were when they were already using biological warfare on right. each other in Europe. Like <laughs> they washed their asses <laughs> and threw and threw their shit in rivers. <laughs> right. And I mean, that's even reflected further back in history in Europe, too, that I don't know where some of them fucking forgot the lessons, but it's another thing that the Moors had to teach people when they yep. were, you know, coming through Europe, too, of like, wait, you only bathe once a year, you dirty motherfucker? No. You know one thing? No, you know, I think a lot... lost your ass. Yeah. <laughs> I want, you know, a lot of people don't know this. A lot of people don't know this, but the practices of drinking blood and urine actually originated in Europe. Not a lot of people know that. Everyone thinks they originated in Africa or, 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 or in Asia or um, or in the Americas. Nope, it originated in Europe. So, yeah. yeah there's, there's a lot that, you know, people don't realize because of history not being taught bullshit. right. But, uh, you know, yep. there's, there's even weird shit like um in european history why it's so traditional for people to have spring weddings is because the springtime is when they would take their annual bath so they would try to get married soon afterwards so they stunk the least at that point in yep. time at their wedding ceremony yeah. <laughs> I, le- I learned something every time i come on here uh because i know all of y'all well read in many different Direct, uh, different subject matters and stuff, but I love I love these type of discussions. I want to bring uh Robert Strong in. Uh, uh, I know he didn't get a chance to yeah. uh, uh, hear the reading. Of, I think you called some of the reading. Uh, you, I you, think you, you did. You're gonna get a kick out of you get a kick out of this. By the way, Kwame, it's just good to see your face, man. Traveling with you <laughs> oh, yeah. was one of the highlights of my life. I felt like <laughs> Titus traveling with the Apostle Paul. To use one of my seminarians, uh, like literally, like we stop and forget. So there he is preaching the gospel to this group of bikers, you know, out in the desert. Um, and and oh, and by the way, I just wanted to show you. I have a, uh, I have a John Torres Revolutionary Diaries, also a good book. Oh uh, yeah, that's my, brother, my brother. That's my first book actually. He signed it for me at, at the LA event, uh, at the Chicano Moratorium March. Um, but uh, but so you're gonna get a kick out of this. You're talking about those young guys being um being coaxed into Nazism. Uh, I got jumped by those guys today. Literally, a bump on my head right here. Um, I uh, Jesus, this is what are you okay? Well, yeah, I'm okay. But it's I mean I've been hit so many times. I mean, look at my face. Jeez. Uh, <laughs> but um, <laughs> but uh, there's a Sadakoy Elementary School that was getting threats because they were going to have a pride event and read a book that just kind of normalized the spectrum of gender. And Nazism has spread really quickly through the Armenian community here and the Russians. Um, and uh, it got really, it got really heavy today. Um, I was there on the line with some of my LGBT brothers and sisters I've been on the line with before, but this is the first time it's, it's gotten this rough. Um, the cops literally divided our line in half, so making the other end of our front line vulnerable. And what happened, just they all poured in from the street on this one kid. And he wasn't even with our march. He was he was a he was a homeless kid who came and we, we shared our coffee with him because we had extra stuff. And so I immediately ran over there and I had my big hickory stick and and, and I had to. I, I, they just descended on me and just started wailing on me. Um, I just I covered my face pretty well. The other kid, though, he he had to go to the hospital. Um, and in a place like Los Angeles, that's supposed to be progressive, we're Hong having Kong. to deal with these fucking Nazis literally in the street, like right now, like today. Um, 
And uh, oh yeah, and the book, the book. I know that's one other thing I wanted to say. Um, <laughs> yeah, the the chapter three thing about language is uh, that is uh, super heavy because in graduate school I studied psycholinguistics, um, and um, one of the studies on language and culture showed that Chinese Canadian students in one particular study took personality tests in Chinese in one set and then on English on another. And they literally had different personality traits on personality profiles depending on which language they answered in. And and there's a, a lot they're learning in psycholinguistics about how language is so much the matrix of reality. Um, and when I think about those native languages being lost, it's not just a set of symbols that's being lost. It's an entire way of thinking about the relationship yep. with the world around them. And I, I uh, one, one of my friends is helping the Cherokee, I know, with their uh, television station out in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, he does uh, visuals for them. Um, but uh, I guess that's all I had to say. I'm nursing a mild concussion and I'm smoking some of my grass when I'm wrong here. <laughs> <laughs> Man. Hey, well, well was, any of, was, was any of the brown berets out there with you, uh, comrade? You know, man, no. I, I hung out with Taquani yesterday, but there were none, none of the brown berets made it out there. And there's kind yeah, of might, a sectarian you might thing that's happening. Uh, you might start, want to start going out with some of the other comrades out there because, look, I didn't, I didn't realize how bad California was until I came out there and you was telling me how the white supremacists. And then when we went up to uh, Portland, Oregon, and uh, we were, I, I feel like we were shot at uh, it was a white person just walked up and just started busting. You know what I'm saying? Whoa. Uh, you, I, I think you heard about that when me and High Thurman uh, was on that book tour up there. Okay, I didn't uh, realize they were shooting you guys. Wow. All right. I, that's what I feel like because it was like right in front of the bar, and it was like they just said this white guy just walked up and just started shooting. You know what I mean? And it was in the direction of where we was at. You know what I mean? Uh, and and uh, way, hit one of the cars. A gun store. Huh? I finally found a good black-owned gun store. Okay, Aye that's yeah. what's up. But yeah, I'm I, taking I, was, care I, of, was just, I was just uh, surprised because I'm out here in, like, this used to be KKK territory, uh, Indiana, when uh, the KKK started, Ku Klux Klan. Yeah. They, moved from Bam, uh, they moved from Tennessee to Indiana. And this became their base in the early uh, 19, uh, 1900s. You know what I mean? But you better not catch one of these motherfucking hood wearing motherfuckers walking down the streets over here. We'll beat they motherfucking ass and dry their ass oh, yeah. over here. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, so that's like surprising to us. Like, even when I was in prison, like the white supremacists, they know if they get into it with the black and brown comrades, we going to spank their ass off in there. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. So to hear that like white supremacy is so strong out there and I'm from Indiana, you know, it's like, what the fuck? Like I could, I would, I would think it would be the opposite. Like here we will be telling y'all stories of how we keep on getting in confrontation with these white supremacists, but these white supremacists here that we, they scared of us. You know what I'm saying? Like they don't even like doing, but like this, I'll bring up one example. I found out from uh uh one of the uh older uh people uh here in Indiana, Indianapolis, that uh the Ku Klux Klan tried to do a march through Hallville, which Hallville is like one of the roughest neighborhoods uh here in Indianapolis. It's not as rough as it was back in the days because they gentrify everything, but they try to walk through Hallville. Man, they had them uh, hoods running all over the place. You heard me? Yeah. Like they was, they never did that shit again. They was like, oh, mm -hmm. hell, now nah. y'all didn't tell it. Y'all didn't tell us this was the roughest part of town. You know what I mean? A black, uh, the black population, they beat their ass and had them running. So like this that's is, just this so is, ironic to me that it's like that is, in California. There's two pieces of information that you guys really need to know tactically. Um, um. They are, they are, the crisis of fascism within the Armenian culture is so big that it's almost like they're, they're, they're worse than the Proud Boys because they already have the Armenian Mafia. And <laughs> when, I was a, when I was a therapist working with cons, I learned a lot about the prison system, uh, inner politics, and the Mexican Mafia has been in it with the Nazis. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and so there's some compromised brown folks. Uh, yeah. I don't know what to do with that, you know? Yeah, that that's a good point. Because uh, when I think about it, I did know about the prison situation out of California. So I read the book uh, about the Mexican mafia and how they started to take over even the street uh, organizations like Serrano's and MS-13. And now that's why they got the 13. The 13 stands for the uh, 13th le letter, which is the M. You know what I mean? Uh, and the Mexican Mafia, uh, because they had so much control in the prisons in California, they threatened all the uh, the uh, the Chicano street organizations on the streets and said, if you come to prison, we're going to fuck y'all motherfuckers up. So right now, even though y'all out there, y'all really under us from now on. And we y'all going to pay taxes to uh, uh, Mexican Mafia. And the Mexican Mafia, if y'all don't know a lot about them, they're very racist. Like they side with the yeah. Aryan Brotherhood. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so that Not that surprising. probably does have a lot to account for why it's like that on the streets and why certain populations that you wouldn't even imagine would be allying themselves with uh, white supremacists and stuff. You know what I mean? I I can say with near certainty that the Mexican Mafia is running the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department. Uh, most I, of the I gangs be are, are Latino. Most of the gangs are Latino fascists. The, the type whose dads fought uh, for the Contras against the Sandinistas. You know, that's why the MS-13. You know, is so vicious because they all lived through really bloody revolutions. You know, and they're yeah. kind of a uh, they're kind of neo-fascist in some ways. Yeah, you know? this this why this imagine. is a good thing our brown comrades, our Chicano comrades be doing what they doing. Because I know when we was out there, uh, a lot of them was, uh, I forget who it was. I want to say it was, uh, it was one of the brown braves, but they was uh, standing up against uh, uh, one of the uh, the three politicians. You remember we we came past that Black Lives Matter uh, encampment they was doing yeah, against them politicians? Right. Yeah. Video. Yeah, and they was uh they were trying to get those politicians kicked out because they was making racist comments about black kids or black babies or something like that. And uh, a lot of the brown berets was speaking about out against that too, which is good, you know what I mean? But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, man, comrade, hey, start start going out there uh with some of the brown berets and some of the other comrades because it looks like it's getting worse out there since the last time we was out there. So yeah, you want you want to be. Uh, have some comrades with you when you out in those type of situations. You know what I mean? Yeah, Indeed. we're gonna be logging some range time pretty soon too. So you know, we're trying to be covered. Yeah, most definitely. Things, things in Florida that, are not looking too good. <laughs> yeah. A lot of that is being propagated by this White Lives Matter movement. Um, that in California specifically, they are the reason why you have like the Goyam League that is anti-Semitic, things like that. Um, the <coughs> guys are, are pushing for recruiting not just fellow white people, but anybody else who is white adjacent who also plays colorism bullshit. Yeah. And bringing them on board like, oh, you hate these other people too? Let's, let's yeah. get together. Um, and sadly like that that's one of those things i mean i i hate even having to deal with celebrity bullshit but why i felt like kicking um what's what's his fucking name you talking uh, about kanye west kanye west I yeah. felt man. Like that man in anti-semitic shithead i hate man. kanye west Man, his anti-Semitic shit, and then people trying to say, "Oh, well, he's black, therefore he's Jewish, so he can't be anti-Semitic." Bro, what? Like, Man, like, okay, I I can tell you as a Jewish woman, <laughs> Jews come in every color of the rainbow, <laughs> but yeah. just because you're black does not mean you are of Hebrew descent either. You know, <laughs> can be, but no, he is fucking anti-Semitic as hell. All right. And, you know, he actually drove a lot of people from other ethnic groups to team up with white supremacists. Yeah, yeah. And play that bullshit. And yeah. that's a big part of why that's growing there. And it's really fucked. Really yeah. fucked. Like, I, I mean, that that's why you've got these motherfuckers out there clowning on themselves, fucking throwing banners over bridges, um, you know, with anti-Semitic shit on it and other, you know, like, 
white lives matter banners and all of that mm -hmm. it's like it's because oh now's a good time like, to call out to my lavender angels homies i wanted i need to go visit them uh kwame remind me uh i want to go do some street patrol time with the lavender angels they're a really badass cadre of queer militants that patrols the queer district of sacramento and and uh they, they kick proud boy ass and they're the yeah. ones who show up in uh -huh. UC when they're trying to uh, disseminate their shit there. Yeah. Good. Yeah, I like that. I'm going to visit them in a few months. That's what's up. <laughs> Was you uh, finished saying what you were saying, Sam? I lost my train of thought. It's all good. <laughs> On your <left. laughs> Okay. Hey, I before we go. I about Nazi activity. Just saying. Hey, before we go, uh, Sally, uh, you there right now? Uh, do you got that picture that you drew of Dennis Banks? You're on mute. Man, huh? listen, look at this, y'all. Look at this. Yo, that oh, it's so gorgeous. Fire. That's oh, awesome. Yeah. This right there, that that right there, that is that um that um that is how we can use cultural revolution. Shit like that right there. Hell yeah. This is one of the coldest artists of our generation. In my opinion, I might be biased because she a part of our movement. But look, oh yeah, Huey P. Newton. Huey P. Newton. Huey P. Newton. Jeffrey Hampton. Jeffrey Hampton. Uh, Please tell me Jeffrey Hampton. Please tell me Jeffrey Hampton. I know she got uh, Prince and Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali, like, Tupac? man. Tupac? Tupac? Uh, Prince. Prince. Prince and uh, Muhammad Ali, she did pictures of them. Yeah, she's cold, man. I had a, I was just thinking about that. I was like, I forgot uh, we got somebody over here that's like cold already did a picture of Dennis Bank. You want to talk about like uh, what inspired you uh, to draw that comrade? Oh, you muted yourself. <laughs> Thanks. Um, actually, um. Decided to. Uh, you uh muted again. Yeah. I know she having like internet issues, but you can uh uh try to unmute yourself again. Okay, go there ahead. we go. There we go. Is it good? Yeah, yep, that's good. So I decided to draw. Oh God. Okay, I decided to draw Dennis Banks because of um well. Uh, the Amer starting the American Indian Movement, which is my number one, uh, like why I wanted to rep him, but also what he did for uh, the boarding schools. He started a lot of like uh, a lawsuit against the government uh, to uh, for the board what, what we went through for boarding schools. Um, also, can you guys hear me? Yeah, we, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, hear you. my was just way behind. Okay, but uh, yeah, that was one of my main reasons why because he started AIM. That was my number one reason. And then after that, it was, I learned, the more I learned about him, the more um, I learned that he did work for, like I said, starting a lawsuit against the government for boarding schools. And also just being, just being a, like a, all the stories and AIM, all the crazy stuff that they went through, it's kind of similar to Black Panthers. I mean, it is. Mm -hmm. So like, that's why I, I just, after I drew Dennis, then I was like, where did they get the idea from? And then I found out about Huey and then it just, you know, it just goes from there. But uh, that's why I really, really, really drew Dennis, though, is because he started the American Indian Movement. So Beautiful. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad. Uh, I, I, I don't know why I'm just now thinking about that. I'm glad you was able to show everybody that because uh, she drew that. Uh, man, and the first time I saw it, I was like, dang, like she is super. Like that picture just could walk out that page and be Dennis Banks. You. you know what I'm I mean? Perfect. So, absolutely yeah keep on keep up uh the drawing and stuff like that because that is the cultural revolution you know what i mean showing that mm -hmm. of our right. generation i feel like that's my part in the revolution also you know to do make art for it and i'm only gonna do revolutionaries forever you know so hell yeah absolutely yeah but so we got you. hey 
I, I don't know if y'all know that, but we got two of the greatest artists of our generation on this call right now. The history really? will recognize. We will re look back and be like, Johnny Torres was like the oh, oh, yeah. Brown Langston Hughes of our generation. Sally <laughs> May, she was like the Picasso of our generation. Uh, generation oh, yeah. uh, revolutionary <laughs> art. You know what I mean? Yep. So think thank like you, that. Comrade. Yes, thank you. Uh, um, 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 I'd say that I say that Sally May, um, Sally May, um, Sally May, and um, and Johnny Torres are um are the Emory Douglas of our generation. <laughs> Emory Douglas, that's even yep. better. Yeah, yeah. I was oh, trying yeah. to think of a revolutionary yeah. artist. Emory yep, Douglas, the, that's the best. The Emory, yeah. <laughs> Emory Douglas is not talked about enough. He's very underrated. He is not talked about enough. Right, right, right. Thank you, Gabby. See, Gabby is nineteen years old. I you you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Have my back on that. Have my back. Yep. I was uh, talking about Picasso <laughs> and trying to emphasize the revolutionary, though. Yep. But you have my back, Gabby. <laughs> yep. I'm, 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 I'm Kwame. Guess what? Guess what, Kwame? Um, guess what book I just bought? Um, I just bought um, Wretched of the Earth. And I'm super excited to read it. I'm super excited to read it. Super uh, excited. You're going to love that. We oh, actually I know I will. Uh, read that book next year when we uh, start transitioning away from studying the history of the uh, groups Black that Panthers. was a part of the Second Rainbow Coalition. Uh, That's one of the books we definitely going to read next year. So, yeah. And, get and uh, Wretched of the Earth and, um, and How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. Those two books are very essential. Very yeah. essential. Walter Rodney. Yeah, yep. absolutely. Uh, We're going to uh, leave this out with oh hell yeah which one is that <laughs> alienation and freedom yeah that's the new oh yeah one, uh, that's the new one of Franz Fanon I think they just discovered this uh his essays or something about this because this just came out right yep holy shit yeah. yeah I gotta get that one that's the only book I haven't read of Franz Fanon I uh, read that one too uh, che, we're going to close this out with you. I know you uh, wanted to say something. I know we uh, spent a good deal of this discussion, but I think this discussion was necessary. Like, this is yes, definitely. this definitely. is an important chapter we just read. Yep. And I'm glad that I was here today to, to be part of it. Uh, I just want to focus in on, on, on something. You know, I don't know if y'all have been watching the news lately, but, you know, I was watching the other day the news where they were talking about that uh, most of all the books that we read, you know, they they consider it racist, and so they try to get it out off the market, you know. And one of the books in particular that I caught, I captivated, uh, was the book on sin, you know, the history of America uh, of the American the American history on Z by Zen. They How is it? Yeah, how it's thin. They're trying to get rid of that. The government is trying to get rid of that book. And, and, and all man, other books. Saying, that book is racist? A lot of books that I got in my in my room, man. <laughs> they all had right. it on display, man. They had it on display. You know, and they saying that 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 is that these books are racist. Ain't that a kick in the ass? You wow. know, but that's one thing I wanted to say. And another thing I wanted to say was very briefly, because this 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 could this could take for hours to talk about, but white people came into existence in the 1700s. <laughs> the word white, the word white, not white people, no, nah, not white. Right, right, the right. Word white came right. into existence. Distance yeah. in the 1700s. Yeah, Anglo-Saxons. I'm not gonna go into that, you know. <laughs> but <laughs> that 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 I, that's a good thing to close out with because uh, and I talk about this in all my uh the book tour. If you haven't studied the Bacon's Rebellion, seven uh sixteen seventy six, study read up on Bacon's Rebellion, seven uh sixteen seventy six. That's where the white concept even came from because white people and black people organized together, even though it was a colonial leader that was leading us and stuff. You dig what I'm saying? We don't uphold uh, Nathan, uh, what's his name? <laughs> Bacon. Uh, 
but we do uphold the fact that we was or, uh, able to come together and recognize that we was strong together. You know what I'm saying? We related to each other. Uh, uh, there was other uprisings, but Bacon Rebellion changed everything in this country, and that's how white supremacy started to become established. And if we're going to yeah. be yeah. historical materialists, if we're going to have a scientific analysis against white supremacy, this is how we explain the origins and development of white supremacy. So study that yep. point that you bring up, Che, because there was no concept of white. People would yep. look up as... Uh, Irish or or English or French or Italian. It was national groups. Yep, yeah. ethnic groups. Yeah, which nationality so was group. Yeah. yeah. So this concept that was brought around about to stop a rainbow coalition from forming. This is yeah. why the rainbow coalition, our arch enemy, comes from that bank re banking rebellion. We are the response against that time in history 400 years later. We are the yep. response. We are the antithesis. And we should always look at ourselves. This is what they always stop wanting to stop. Everybody on here is different ethnicities. You know what I'm saying? Black, brown, yep. red, white. You know what I'm saying? Uh, we gonna have some yellow comrades on here pretty soon <laughs> once we start to bring in some Asian comrades. Oh, yeah. We have Asian that's a part of <laughs> Groups that's already a part of the Rainbow Coalition, but this is how we defeat these motherfuckers. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna end with, uh, the the speech that uh uh Fred Hampton he he was talking about. Hey, when we when we get done with the work in the valley, when we get done with the work in the valley, then we gotta go to the mountaintop. We gotta go yep. to a mountaintop because it's been a motherfucker on the mountaintop them being bullshitting us. You know what I'm saying? Yep. We don't want to live their lifestyle to be like them, we going up there to let that motherfucker know, God damn it, we coming from the valley. And that's yep. what we represent. You know what I mean? All power to the people. All power all to power. the people. All power. All power. And all power. Panther so, power. We can, uh, we'll be back on here at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, uh, and that's what, 11 o'clock out Sunday. there on, uh, this Sunday. Sunday. So uh, I and all y'all comrades then uh cat will be hosting that but i'm pretty sure a lot of us will be on there uh to help her out though but y'all have a good weekend comrade okay love y'all love y'all love right. you guys all power all power to the people